All right, good morning, everyone. Welcome to the Institute of Politics. Thank you for joining us today for our event on the French presidential election. My name is Sapna Desai, and I'm a fourth year student in the college. I'm honored to be introducing our panelists and moderator today, who will be having a conversation on the upcoming French presidential election in April and the future of French politics. Our guests include Pierre Giacometti, Giacometti Ben Haddad, Roland Lescure, and Sophie Petter. Pierre Giacometti has over 25 years of experience in market research and opinion analysis. He was managing director of the Ipsos Group, a market research and consulting firm, before he co-founded the company, NOCOM. For the past five years, since President Emmanuel Macron has been in office, his company has been monitoring the perceptions of the French on the president's actions and transformations of the country. Ben Haddad is an expert in European politics and transatlantic relations. He is currently the senior director of the Europe Center at the Atlantic Council, and he has been published in many newspapers, including the Wall Street Journal, Le Monde, Le Figaro, and he's a frequent contri contributor on France 24, CNN, Fox News, and NPR. His work has often advocated for greater European and transatlantic unity. Roland Lescure is the spokesperson for La République en Marche, the liberal political party founded by President Emmanuel Macron, and he has been serving on the French National Assembly since the 2017 elections. He's currently chairman of the Economic Affairs Committee for the National Assembly, and he represents French citizens of North America. Sophie Petter is the Paris Bureau Chief for The Economist, and she writes about French politics and economics. Before working for The Economist, she worked as a research assistant at the University of Chicago's Urban Poverty and Family Life Project. More recently, she authored a biography of Emmanuel Macron called Revolution Francaise, Emmanuel Macron and the Quest to Reinvent a Nation. The discussion today will be moderated by James McCauley, a contributing columnist for the Washington Post focused on French and European politics and culture. He previously served as the Post Paris correspondent. Thank you so much for joining us today, and I will hand it off to James. Oh, thank you so much, Sapna, for that very kind introduction, and it is a pleasure to be here with you all today. Thank you so much to our hosts at the University of Chicago Institute of Politics, and um, indeed to all of our panelists to, uh, for, for, for having made the time. Um, I should say that um, we've all sort of crossed paths um, in recent years, and it is a pleasure to have everyone here on the same, um, if not in the same place, then on the same screen for a while. Um, and um, I mean, really, it's, um, it's impossible to imagine a better lineup of um, experts to talk about these issues. Um, I um, will get started by, um, so we'll, we'll speak for about 40 minutes. I will start with um, some questions for our panelists about the situation in Ukraine in which the uh, 2022 presidential election campaign has unfolded. And then we will make our way from there into more um, domestic concerns. So I wonder, um, and, and first of all, I just want to say, as um, as one of her former, I was going to start with a question for Sophie. Um, and I, I should say, just to all of the the students listening, um, as one of Sophie's sort of former competitors, she is sort of the top journalist on the beat, um, and has has done by far, in a way, the sort of the best and and most impressively sourced coverage of Macron for years now, and has sort of followed the Macron phenomenon from. Uh, before the beginning, and um, we will see where it where it leads um, in a couple of weeks. But um, anyway, I know Sophie that you were with the president as he traveled um, in the lead up to the war in in Ukraine, sort of between Kiev and Moscow. And I was wondering if you could um, if we could start with just assessing what the French president was trying to do in the region before the war and where things stand now from what you observed. So how, um, what was the objective and how has that played out in the, the weeks and months now since? Thank you, James. That's far too kind of you. And um, thanks to the University of Chicago for organizing this. It's a real pleasure to join you. I think that looking back on that trip, which was right at the beginning of February, about February the 7th from an, an 8th, um, you know, at that moment, I think there was a real hope, at least certainly here in Paris and among the French foreign policy uh, advisors that surround Macron, that that. Putin could be stopped, that there was a possibility that in, by keeping this channel of communication open to him, it might be possible to uh, resolve the issues by diplomacy, that, that it was not 
a foregone conclusion that he would take the risk that he did. Um, and that was, I don't think the French were the only people who were thinking that the, the risk was, you know, beyond what was reasonable for the Russian president to take. Um, that therefore, when we went off to Moscow, first of all, and as you re you'll recall the image of Macron sitting at five meters away around that gigantic table, uh, sitting for, for more than um, five hours talking, and they held the press conference from memory. It was at one, six past one in the morning, I seem to remember the press conference. Um, and then there was, it was a very strange atmosphere, and this is what Macron was talking about to the reporters who, who kept travelled with him on the plane the next day when we went to Kiev, then to see Zelensky, that it was um, it was extremely tense. You know, I don't think Macron went in there with his uh, with, with the sort of naive sense of what he was trying to achieve. He, he, he described the tension in the room, a much more rigid character than the President Putin that he'd met in the past, who he'd hosted in Versailles and at his Mediterranean retreat. At the beginning of his term, and I think that you know what he was trying to do, and that you know is the, the, the point of your question. What he was trying to do was to uh, pass messages to Putin that this the cost of the war would be extremely high, that sanctions would be very tight, that the West would be unified, and that they meant it, um, and try to show that there was an alternative, and not allow Putin to ever be able to say there wasn't an alternative to war. So I think that's what he was trying to do. And, and I, you know, it, it, in listening to him on the plane between Moscow and Kiev, he wasn't naive about this. You know, he has his eyes wide open he understood exactly what the risk was and the personal risk to him because of course he was putting him, himself in a position to be um of, of personal risk um political mm -hmm. risk in doing this so i think that's where that's what it was all about and 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 you know retrospectively i, I think that he would defend what he's done and since the wars happened obviously he failed to stop putin invading we all know that uh, but I think that the point of keeping that channel open is is that um, is the same, you know, that there is the hope that at some point dialogue is going to have to happen and that Putin needs someone in the West as a member of the Western alliance that uh, that he can talk to. Mm -hmm. And now, um, uh, thank you for that. Uh, that that leaves us a lot to talk about. I think I might um, if I if I could ask Ben a question, um, you know, Ben, I know, uh, first of all, um, just so our audience is aware, Ben has written extensively and very, very well about the general issue of European strategic autonomy, um, especially in a sort of changing transatlantic ecosystem. And, you know, to that end, I think that this is a moment, I mean, and, and of course, I, I should say um, that this has been uh, for years now, a key sort of um, uh, talking point of President Macron. And you know the, the the return of ground war to Europe um, would seem to uh, vindicate a lot of the convictions of um, the Elysee over the past year. So Ben, I'd just like to ask you, I mean, how do you see all of that? Am I right in thinking that there is um, that the the issue of strategic autonomy seems a bit, um, a bit more realistic now, or are we, or, or should we still be skeptical about how it might actually work out um, in practice now that um, we have the Europe that we have? Um, yes, James, I, I completely agree with uh, what you just said. So first, let me thank also uh, the University of Chicago uh, for this invitation, this timely conversation. Um, I think what's happened on February 24th has been a shell shock to uh, Europeans. Uh, now, to be fair, uh, I think maybe a lot of us were a little bit in denial about the uh, environment of threat and challenges that we face in our direct neighborhood. You know, we've had wars in the Western Balkans in the 90s. We had already a Russian aggression against Georgia in 2008 against Ukraine in 2014. But you're right, the fact that this is a, a, a ground war with tanks crossing a border with such an aggressive sort of total war uh, discourse coming from Vladimir Putin has reminded uh, Europeans that what we thought we had eradicated since World War II is back on the European continent and we need to draw uh, conclusions from it. And I think you've already seen this in the very first days that followed the invasion with uh, Germany not only overturning decades of policy on sending weapons to Ukraine, but of course announcing dramatic uh, increase in defense spending and 100 uh, billion in one year uh, to renovate uh, defense equipments, Sweden, 
uh, Denmark, uh, Poland, which is, has always been, uh, I think, a, an important military mm -hmm. actor, but even announcing that it's increasing its defense spending to 3%. Uh, Sweden and Finland having very deep debates about uh, the question of joining NATO, uh, which here again, you can easily understand as they're directly threatened by uh, Russia. Um, but beyond also the sole uh, military dimension, and I think clearly, you know, we're going to be at the beginning of a generational effort towards rearmament uh, on the European continent, uh, the question of strategic autonomy or European sovereignty, which was really at the core of President Macron's agenda ever since, I would say, his presidential campaign, but at the very least, it's his famous speech at Sorbonne in 20. Uh, 17 encompasses many dimensions. There's the military one. There's also clearly the question of uh, energy uh, independent that's at the core of the conversations right now uh, in Europe with the European Commission laying out an agenda to cut down to zero dependence on uh, Russian oil and gas. We know that gas is going to be difficult because it demands really heavy uh, investments and um, diversifying suppliers. Uh, but this is there's a an, an agenda to cut to zero by 2030, which, by the way, parenthesis, I think even if we come to a form of diplomatic agreement or ceasefire in the next few weeks or months uh, between Russia and Ukraine, I think this is still an agenda that Europeans should move forward. We understand now that there's a political dimension to this energy relationship with uh, Russia that's being used as a, as a leverage on European democracies and economies. Um, I think here again, France has been the forefront of this issue, obviously investing in uh, nuclear power uh, and so being much less dependent on Russia. So we'll have to diversify suppliers, invest in nuclear, and of course, invest in uh, renewables uh, in the in the coming years and, and decade. And then, you know, there's a broader agenda from food security to the question of uh, critical technologies. Um, and here, of course, you know, you include the Chinese dimension uh, we've had conversations about Huawei in the last few years. So clearly Europeans, you know, thinking in you as a power, uh, thinking also in terms of power politics. So understanding, you know, the political and strategic dimension of things like uh, energy, I think will be really critical in the coming years. One other aspect, though, that's interesting um, is that NATO is back really at the forefront of the conversation. And we remember that President Macron uh, had uh, in I think Sophie remembers yes. this better than anyone else. The German was to give us the quote. Just, just the quote. Yeah. Um, President Macron at the time uh, under Donald Trump, and uh, I would say the context is important after the Turkish intervention in Northeast Syria uh, that had clearly revealed uh, uh, flaws and divisions within the alliance had talked about NATO being a, a brain dead. What's interesting what you're seeing today is France is fully participating in NATO reassurance. It's uh, proposed the creation of a NATO reassurance mission in Romania, it has troops in Estonia, it's increasing its, its presence in Central Europe. So it's fully participating, I think, to solidarity uh, with allies. And I think it's always been clear, um, although there's been, you know, sometimes mistranslation, misunderstanding in the United States or in other uh, European countries, it's always been clear to the French that there's no contradiction between having a strong NATO in which the United States is committed, but also a strong European defense. I think it's always been clear that, you know, NATO is critical to uh, collective defense on the European continent, especially for strategic threats such as Russia when it comes to Article 5. And so, you know, seeing more American and European troops in Central Europe is, is welcomed in Paris. But that doesn't solve the question of what if a crisis happens tomorrow in the Western Balkans, in uh, the Sahel, North Africa, in Libya, you know, areas where the United States, even under President Biden, has signaled that it doesn't have the appetite to intervene on behalf of Europeans anymore. Clearly, Europeans will have to step up and take responsibility. Um, and seeing Europeans increase their defense spending and, and rearm is also good news in, in that sense. So I think we're we're going in the right direction in, in this respect. Mm -hmm. And just as a follow-up question to that, um, I think what you're saying makes a ton of sense. Um, but en même temps, to use the, 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 the golden phrase of uh, the, the Macron years, um, how do you see some of the stumbles that have happened, um, especially on the French diplomatic side since the start of the war? So there was this sort of um, the, the U-turn on Mariupol for the moment, and then also 
Um, just the other day, President Zelensky of Ukraine told, I believe, The Economist again, it's always The Economist um, with the with the great interviews these days, um, that the uh, that the French are, as I believe he put it, afraid of the Russians. Um, how do we how are we to make uh, what, what are we to make of those kind of comments and sentiments? So on the Zelensky quote uh, and, you know, I'll let maybe Sophie correct me or contradict me. Um, Zelensky is not the one who uh, raised the French. It's actually the economist in the interview. Zelensky did not mention anyone specifically. The, the question said, uh, some allies like France don't want to send tanks. It's my understanding that no ally is actually currently sending tanks. So I don't understand why the question singled out France rather than anyone else, including the United States. And so mm -hmm. Zelensky gave a, a, a broad answer. I think the British press interpreted this as uh, singling out Macron specifically. Uh, Zelensky has actually praised Macron repeatedly for his diplomatic efforts, uh, both on Twitter and when he spoke at the National Assembly. A lot of the conversations between President Macron and Putin were actually uh, held at the request of uh, President Zelensky very often. You know, President Zelensky has been asking, I met him in January in, in Kiev already before the war, and he's always been asking to meet with Putin. It's really one of his key demands. He wants to sit down with Putin and sort of hash this out. Um, and so he's using the intermediaries that he has. There's not only Macron, Olaf Scholz, of course, uh, Erdogan to a certain extent, uh, Naftali Bennett, all mm -hmm. of them with really limited success. Because right now, I think, you know, everyone's take, trying to take responsibility. Everyone's trying to play a diplomatic uh, role. Clearly, you have, uh, you know, Russia is is close to this right now. Um, you know, I think we have to continue. My sense is we have to continue to try keeping that channel open as long as, A, you do it uh, in increasing co constantly the cost and the pressure on Russia. So keeping a united front on sanctions continuing to supply weapons. And I think we could do much more when it comes to supplying weapons to uh, Ukraine. I personally don't really understand the distinction between defensive and offensive weapons, but that's, I would say, another debate. But, you know, you continue to do this to increase the pressure on Russia and hope maybe for some sort of negotiated diplomatic exit. That's what the Ukrainians are even asking from us. So, you know, you do it without any illusion of who you're speaking to. Uh, and, uh, you know, same thing on, on Mariupol. It was worth a try. Uh, it was interesting to see that it's been done by France and Turkey together uh, and Greece, by the way. So when you see the tensions that you had between these three actors, you understand the, the dramatic urgency of this situation that, you know, it brought together Mitsotakis, Erdogan and, and Macron. Um, but at the same time, you know, once again, it takes two to tango. It's, so it's, it's really it's really difficult. Good. Thank you for that. Um, Roland, um, I think. Um, a question for you on, um, if, if I may, on the way in which the, um, I mean, as, as a representative of, um, of, of France and of the president overseas, um, I mean, how would you say that this, um, th this sort of larger diplomatic um, situation in Europe has affected the presidential campaign at home? Because of course, you know, in a matter of weeks, the French will choose their, Will go to the polls and choose their next president, whether they will re-elect Macron um, or choose someone else. I mean, how would you say what we're seeing in Ukraine has um, has affected domestic politics at home? Massively, you know, it's it's got a massive impact. Uh, it's never happened before. You know, there's been events, and they usually are decisive event in every French election, but they usually are domestic. There's usually something that happens that crystallizes the campaign mm -hmm. and that makes everything revolute around it, but it's, it's never happened to such an extent. And obviously war at the doorsteps of, of Europe hadn't happened as Benjamin said for a while. So it's, it's got a massive impact. The first impact was the fact that Macron being the current president of Europe and, and on the front line of all the discussions that uh, Sophie and Ben have, have discussed with you has looked presidential, has looked in charge, has looked as a trying. And as it's been said by both Sophie and Ben, he's never been naive, but he's always been hopeful that his intervention could help maneuver the way around the thin line, which is not getting at war, but avoiding war, and now that war is happening, still not making war, but trying to make sure that war ceases. 
and it's a thin line, but it's, it's certainly looked here and probably abroad as one of the main pillars of that of that strategy, very complementary to, to the other leaders that are involved. Two, and that's more difficult for him, it has prevented him from campaigning. You know, a lot of the opponents have said he doesn't want to campaign, but he's obviously been hugely busy. There's been two European summits in two weeks. There's been a couple of NATO meetings. There's been one G7 meetings. Mm -hmm. And him as the chair of, of the EU council, or the, the sitting chair, or the current chair of the, of the EU, had to manage it all. So he has really been, uh, it's been hard for him to, to actually campaign. And as you probably know, because you've been following him for a while, both you and, and Sophie, he loves campaigning. There's nothing that he loves more than being on a stage, telling the story of France the way he sees it, interacting with people in the street. He's been doing this this week and he hadn't been able to do so for two or three weeks. It has to be said that on the other hand, most competitors don't look as presidential that as him as a result of him being in charge. So it's probably helped him at the margin in the polls. It has affected three or four main contenders that were to say the least, ambiguous in their relationship with, with Putin over the last 10 to even more years. You know, Marine Le Pen, it's known, had her campaign financed by Russia uh, five years ago. She has been saying a lot of times that the guy was great and that we need one of those guys in France. The newcomer, Eric Zemmour, has also been praising Putin and said that there was no way Putin was going to invade Ukraine up to 10 days before he did so. And last but not least, Jean-Luc Mélenchon, who's on the extreme left, as you know, James, there always needs to be two or three different extreme left candidates in any presidential campaign in France. But this guy is the main one, has been also very ambiguous about Russian uh, position in the world and certainly France position in NATO. Despite all of that, despite those three main contenders being heavily decriminalized by what happened in Russia, there are still today the three main contenders, at least according to the polls of Emmanuel Macron. And, and very likely one of those three is gonna be in the second round. We'll probably get, get back to that in a second. So in a way, the short answer to your question, yes, it has affected it dramatically. But at the end of the day, you still see that the fight that the polls are predicting are a fight between a liberal, pro-democratic, Western Macron and three, to different extents, pretty much pro-Putin or at least ambiguous with Putin and probably not that democratic uh, candidate. So it says a lot about the, the fight that's taking place right now in France, in Europe and probably in the world. Mm -hmm. um, that's a great sort of segue into the domestic situation. And Pierre, um, I was wondering, as somebody who's worked so much in polling, um, if you could sort of explain maybe in a bit more detail the lay of the land as it currently stands. And I know that, you know, um, you know France has some of the most uh, reliable polls, at least that I have seen compared to our own in the United States. So um, they, they, they do tell us something. And um, I mean, building off of what Roland said, um, you know, it, it, it's certainly true that the connections, for instance, between Marine Le Pen and the Kremlin um, are well known. And, you know, there's that famous picture of her with Putin. Um, all the connections that Pierre mentioned are absolutely true. But it's also the case that currently um, polls show her even stronger um, in this 2022 election, despite the, the, the war in Europe with Russia than she was in 2017. And so Pierre, I wonder if you might um, explain to us what's going on there. And you know, th there've been lots of reports in the French press about apathy, about abstention, which seems to be at, at um, increasingly high levels and where, th where that is all coming from and why voters feel even in this time of, or perhaps because of this time of war, that the um, to use the the phrase from one of the articles, the magic has gone from the Macron campaign, which, as Roland just said, is not really much of a campaign this year at all. Thanks for the invitation. Uh, it was really interesting to to hear Roland describing the situation on on Macron's side, but I think that if we are looking actually the situation in France ten days before the first turn. The first point that you have to have in mind, it's the very low level of interest to the campaign. We have never observed this kind of low level of interest on the campaign since the beginning of the Fifth Republic, 
probably we will have the most, the, the, the worst level of turnout on the next uh, first turn, which is very important because depending on these figures, probably we will have the, the final uh, figures of each of the candidates. Because we know, for example, that for Marine Le Pen, uh, the social support of Marine Le Pen is very important on the middle class and lower class. And depending on the level of mobilization of these classes will be probably the result high or low than expected from Marine Le Pen. That's the first, first key point that I want to mention. Second, when we are looking at the actual figures, even if Macron is still the favorite for winning the election, now when we are putting all the radicalism candidates uh, together, it's more than more or less between 50 and 60% of the in vote intention in favor of left or right radicalism party, which give you an impression quite serious about the social situation of France since five years, and probably more than five years. Actually, we have two parties, the government parties, Les Républicains the, on the right side, and Socialist Party on the left side, which have been doing all these decades, the most important parties for French Republic, Fifth Republic, now we are, when you are looking at the figures of Anne Hidalgo, the socialist candidate, 2%, 2%, that's it's incredible for looking at the history of this party, 2%, and the actual candidate for Les Républicains, which is Valérie Pécresse, the actual French um, region president of Ile de France, the most important pre uh, region of France, it's around 10%. Then both parties represent no more than 10% of vote intention, which is really incredible when you are looking the history of the French Rep Fifth Republic, actually. Then I will mention one kind of very important point in the last 10 days. In my career, I, I have the opportunity to, uh, to follow six uh, presidential elections. Always in the last 10 days of the campaign, there was big movement in terms of evolution of each, can of, not of each candidate, but for most of, of the candidates. Then, it's not possible now to say that it's definitive to say that Marine Le Pen will be the candidate against Macron. My impression is that he, she's winning actually the battle among the right side. But be careful because when you are looking at the, the raising evolution coming from Mélenchon, we talked about him before, Mélenchon now is on 15% of vote intention, Marine Le Pen around 20, and Macron more than 26, 27, 28. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure about the final um, finalists of the battle, but it's clear that it's incredible to think when you are looking at the, the, the French political map that now the two main protagonists against Macron are coming from the radicalism side, from the left and from the, 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 the right. That seems to be that even if Macron will be re-elected, the political battle in the next few months in France will be the, the, the result of this big defeat coming from the French government parties, Parti Socialiste and Le Républicain, and the rising position coming from Mélenchon and Le Pen. And you don't have to forget that these two guys have been defeated five years ago. A lot of experts and common commentators say during all these five years that they, they, they were dead, uh, it's finished for them, they will not be succeeded and they will not be come back on the next election. And when you are looking the result, actually, it's only, obviously it's only polls, but when you are looking the result, actually, they are winning the battle concerning the final, the, 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 the position to be finalist against Macron. And that's, it's really for me incredible to observe the defeat that we are facing the two governments, traditional government and moderate parties of Parti Socialist and Republican against this kind of profile. And last, but on the list, just a comment about, about uh, Eric Zemmour. Mm -hmm. uh, we, know, we know that probably he's not uh, obtaining actually the result he's expecting when he, he decides to, to go to this big challenge. But in fact, from my point of view, even if he's around 10%, it's a big victory for himself because 10% coming from his own story, which is a story a few months ago, he was only a journalist, to obtain, if he obtained 10%, it will be very impressive from my point of view. It's another proof of the declining 
political system party in France when a, a guy as a journalist is able to obtain 10% in the French presidential election. Mm -hmm. That's more or less the, the panorama that I can describe um, to make a, a short sum up about the situation that we are facing actually. I think it's it's fascinating what you what you were saying, and I think we've all observed that um, this cycle, but also to some extent in the previous election campaign when it was also Macron versus um, Le Pen, but then also at the time Mélenchon was not perhaps as uh, powerful in the polls as he's projected to be this time, but still um, uh, present. Um, and so you had the sort of center camp of the Macron candidacy versus the radicals on the right and left again. And I wonder, um, you know, Pierre, if you could just say a little bit more about where where that that sense of, of both disinterest in this election um, comes from and also the sense of appeal that these um, extremist candidates or if you want to say radical candidates uh, comes from like what 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 are we talking about here? I mean, I think um, all of us here have been through the last five years in France. There have been, there was the Gilets Jaunes uprising in 2018, 2019. There have been transit strikes. There was the coronavirus pandemic, um, so on and so forth. I mean, a lot has happened, but I wonder, can you identify a specific um, uh, cause or explanation or is it overdetermined? Well, I will mention three points to explain this situation first. Uh, the deep crisis of democracy in France, it's not due to Macron or due to Hollande or due to Sarkozy. It's a, a world problem issue that we are facing since probably two decades. Uh, the, the, the decrease of turnout in each election, it's really demonstrated in each, all these past last years. Um, actually, in Europe, it's just quite exceptional because when you are looking at other countries, neighbors country we are not facing the same phenomenon. That it's really interesting to observe France as a sort of a European um, country facing crisis of democracy, of representative democracy. Uh, you, you don't have to, to forget that last year on the regional election, 65% uh, of the French public opinion decided not to vote. And how we can explain that? I think that's it's first the defeat of polit politicians because when you are looking the polls, actually, uh, a large majority of French public opinion saying that at the end, the French politicians coming from the right or from the left are not solving problem and not uh, uh, giving solution to the domestic problem. We talk a lot of uh, crisis of Ukraine since uh, one month. My fear on this situation is that part of the French public opinion say, well, we are talking about uh, and international issues, but it's not our main issues. Our domestic issues are not really taken charge by the main candidates. And that's the risk for another um, example of lower turnout. The second element that uh, we are facing, is probably um, a crisis about uh, political identity. People are asking frequently on these pools, what is really the left alternative that we are uh, taking? taking care actually no left alternative no really credible right alternative to macron then the question actually mm -hmm. when i'm looking frequently the polls even if now i'm acting as a communication consultant but i'm looking still working with with public opinion research one of these features actually are very interesting which is a very simple question you ask to french public opinion two options and they have to decide between the two options the first one is we agree to push France as a country which need to be adapt to the globalization. That was the first option. And the second one was, we don't want to go on this globalization protect. We think that the first priority for France is to protect its identity. It's the battle between globalization and identity. And when you are looking at the figures of this kind of survey, five years ago, when Macron was, was elected, 65% of French public opinion was supporting the first option. Mm -hmm. We agree for adaptation. We agree with uh, globalization. But when we are, and third of public opinion was saying, we are in supporting identity, protection of identity. When you are looking at the last figures that we had in the last, due, uh, last January, the battle was 50-50. We, we, in five years, now the two options 
are really showing a sort of very divided country. 50 mm. in favor of globalization yeah. adaptation and 50% want to protect the French identity. That reminds me, I mean, uh, Sophie, recently um, you published a, a fascinating article that I think captures what so many of us um, foreign correspondents or just indeed foreigners who come to France feel, which is that, you know, on the one hand, um, look, like compared to other countries recovering from the coronavirus um, economic uh, stunt, France has done comparatively well. Um, it in so many ways is a success story. I mean, and, and that's just um, in terms of, you know, um, a model welfare state in the 21st century, you know, it, the, the quality of public education, social services, healthcare, I mean, compared to at least where, you know, the United States or um, in, in Britain in many instances, I mean, it's, it is, um, you know, it's got a lot going for it. And yet at the same time, there is this deeply ingrained sense of kind of, there's a whole, I mean, there's a burgeoning decline industry. Um, there is this belief that France is sort of in inexorable and terminal decline. And I mean, that, that has intellectual um, antecedents going back to the late 19th century. But I mean, today, I mean, in your, your piece, I think it was something like 75% if I'm not if I'm remembering correctly of the according to the economist poll say that you know France is in sort of bad shape and what I mean what is your sense of that I mean why why do people feel that so much has gone wrong even though the empirical evidence would suggest otherwise it, it, it's fascinating uh, James and I don't think there's a simple answer to this it's sort of multiple answers I mean it, one of them is it, one of the striking facts that is the um, polling data on happiness and this is this predates uh, the pandemic so we're talking about um, polls going back a number of years and if you do international comparisons of um, you know what I, I, I is France a good place to be you know are you happy do you think France is heading in the right direction the French are overwhelmingly pessimistic compared with uh, other other nations and uh you know you, you can you can pick all sorts of, of of explanations for this i mean the french are idealists maybe reality doesn't live up to it you know the french have an incredibly strong critical spirit as they call it l'esprit critique which i think is sort of taught and in, it's indoctrinated into small french people and i can see ronan laughing but i i really and ben as well but i think it's true that there's it, there's this um uh, tendency that is taught to the French to criticize everything, criticize it in a positive way when it comes to sort of intellectual criticism, but it can also lead into a constant sort of debate. And the French are very political; they love debates, they love criticizing, and I think that's part of the the, the French character. But it's I, you know at the moment when you look at the pessimism that's out there, I think we're in a different situation. It, it clearly is linked to the political disengagement, but we're in a different situation here. Uh, you know, as you said at the beginning, James, we're at a time of war. Um, the whole of Europe is feeling extremely nervous about what's happening. Um, you know, France is geographically connected to Ukraine in the way that the UK isn't, for example, uh, because of the, the, the English Channel. And I think that, that psychologically that does have an impact on feeling it's very easy. You can drive to Ukraine from here. You can take a train. There are trains coming in uh, all the time from Germany uh, for, or from, from Ukraine by Poland, by Germany, bringing Ukrainians into France. It feels very close. So I think, you know, we are looking at a time when all of these sort of underlying uh, factors and, and trends and dynamics that have been in France for a while are sort of, uh, uh, you know, coming together at a particularly sober moment, which, which, is, which is, I think, intensifying this sense of, of discontent and... Um, it's not everywhere. I mean, I think there'll be a mistake to leave this discussion with the idea that France everywhere is feeling depressed and, 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 and sober. I mean, one, just I'll, I'll be very quick, but I did a reporting piece uh, just uh, this week, which was about the contrast between some of the areas in France, which are really feeling as if the world has sort of passed them by and they are feeling exactly what we've just been describing. But there's also lots of places in France that aren't feeling that. And mm -hmm. if you go to some of the big cities, one of the things that struck me over the last five years is how there's a, there's a re really renewed dynamism in a lot of French regional cities, not necessarily Paris, Paris too, but not only Paris. Um, mm -hmm. You can go to Lille, you can go to Bordeaux, you can go to Marseille, you can go to Lyon. You find, you know, there's a very different sort of young, very dynamic, thriving mm -hmm. culture, startup culture, entrepreneurialism, and, and that that is also new in France. So I think one one needs to remember that there's there are both the, both sides to the country mm -hmm. and um you know roland a question um for you about 
Macron versus the other contenders at this point. Um, you know, he said the other day that, you know, he's done everything in his power to fight against the, well, the far right specifically, um, you know, given that he defeated Le Pen in 2017, two of the uh, kind of major opponents so far have been Eric Zemmour, far right uh, extremist, former Le Figaro journalist, and of course, Marine Le Pen again. So in what ways has Macron actually fought the far right? And is he right in saying that he's done everything in his power to, um, to combat them? I mean, I don't want to diffuse the answer, but let's not forget that uh, five or six years ago, Donald Trump got elected in the US, six months after the Brexit was voted in, Matteo Salvini was the prime minister of Italy for a couple of years. So everything we've been talking about now it's not just a sole French phenomenon. The way it expressed itself in the French presidential election, which leads the French people to elect their king or queen every five years, is very specific. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and it has shown five years ago where, again, you know, the progressive, optimistic, open camp was, as, uh, as Pierre Giacometti was saying, you know, about 60, 70 percent, whereas the other camp was more on the 30 side. And this time, when you add the polls, it's more on, on the 50-50. We shouldn't forget either that we are getting out of a pandemic. And as Sophie said, we are at the brink of war. On, well, we are at war in our doorstep, and we ourselves feel pretty much uh, including that war. And when you look at the history of pandemics and war, they usually don't lead to optimism. So there's, there's, a, there's a general feeling that the world is not doing so well. Is that a good enough reason to say that we've done nothing? No, I think we've done quite a bit. And honestly, it hasn't been commented enough with some success. When you look at the results of the European elections in 2019, Marine Le Pen's party did worse than they did at the previous one. It's also the case of municipal, local, regional elections that happened a couple of years ago. Again, the National Front had receded compared with the previous one. It might not be the case this time, but again, you know, hope, campaigning, a lot of willingness gives us another 10 days to change that dynamic, which hopefully will happen. But again, I think what Pierre said earlier about the crumbling of the traditional parties has led no one else now but us and I regret it, by the way, I'm not happy about it, to fight those extremist views, including the extreme white you're talking about. I mean, what's happening with Zemmour is very close to what happened with Trump in the States. You know, there's a leader that's populist that's trying to put together extreme right and traditional right tendencies. And thank God he hasn't managed to do so yet. But he may succeed in, a, in, in the next mandate. And again, Pierre alluded to that earlier. 10 to 12 percent for someone who was non existing, you know, 10 months ago reminds me of what happened to the Tea Party in the US that started by just being the 10 that walks the dog in the US Congress, but that led five years later to the election of Donald Trump. So we have done what we could. I think we've done a lot in terms of economic reforms. We've done a lot in terms of unemployment uh, successes, but it's not the economy stupid anymore. There's also beyond the economic results, which I think have been good, an identity issue that's not as easy to solve, and traditional parties that unfortunately have crumbled and left us a bit the only man in town. Yeah, I think that's that's a really um, interesting way of looking at things. And I agree that um, you're right that it's not merely, I mean, in everywhere, but especially in France in recent years, it is not just a sort of simple matter of economics. It's also this sort of, identity issue. Um, and again, you know, there's a long sort of French tradition of um, anxiety over the future of the nation, et cetera, et cetera. Um, you know, Ben, I, I wonder um, if uh, I might ask you, um, you know, is the battle of ideas, so to speak, over the um, identity or, or even if you want to say the soul of the nation, is that a contest in which the far right has a natural advantage? Um, I hope not. I hope not. I think it's actually a responsibility of uh, mainstream and let's say moderate uh, 
intellectuals, uh, activists, and politicians to reclaim this and not let it be hijacked by uh, populists and, and extremists. And I think it's true that for a long time, which I think partly explains the collapse of the center left and the center right in France, uh, traditional parties have abandoned the debate about identity, uh, the debate about uh, question of integration, um, Islamism uh, as well, but also broader debates that uh, Macron has seized on very well, such as uh, Europe. You know, what was so interesting, if you look at uh, the political climate before the 2017 election, 2014, 15, 16, uh, there, there were a couple of things. I mean, one was that uh, the relationship to the European Union, which is a, a deeply identity issue as well, uh, was a major dividing factor in French society as it was in other European societies, but that wasn't reflected in the right-left de debate uh, because you had deep divisions on Europe within the Socialist Party and within the Republican Party. It people who really strongly disagreed and could hardly coexist. And for a long time, these parties considered that the European issue um, was secondary enough so that they could coexist, they could make pro-European and sovereignist uh, Eurosceptics coexist in the same parties. And I think Macron understood before everyone else that, uh, well, to be fair, actually, no, not before everyone else. The people who understood this before everyone else were the, were the far right. Uh, I think Marine Le Pen understood that this was becoming a dividing line and that she had to uh, become sort of the main opposition force this way in, uh, in France. Um, and so uh, Macron built, I think, en marche, his political offer as a clear pro-European, liberal, progressive response to what he was seeing emerging as a key threat in French politics, which was the fact that the National Front had become the first party of France in the European elections in 2014 and in the regional elections in, in 2015 and bringing uh, people from the center left and the center right together. And what was so interesting in the way he did it, I think, is that instead of being defensive about it, he would really go on offense on, uh, on Europe and really shaping a very sort of identity-based, enthusiastic pro-European uh, message. And I remember, you know, during the, the Brexit referendum, um, you had on the one hand, uh, Eurosceptics, pro-Brexit partisans were making a, uh, a very impassioned case for independence and sovereignty and national identity. And on the other hand, you had defensive uh, accounting-based uh, arguments saying, well, we, you know, the cost-benefit analysis is better to stay within the European Union. You're always going to lose a campaign like this. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, he built a campaign that went much more on offense when it comes to, uh, to Europe. Uh, I think, you know, reclaiming a positive, open sense of national identity that's not in denial of the very real challenges that we face. And, you know, he's been talking a lot these last few years about separatism, about the, the threat of uh, Islamist radicalism, but at the same time trying to do it in a way that's still universalist uh, and that still leaves people, uh, you know, uh, uh, live their religious identities. Uh, and so thereby refusing the way the far right is, is talking about it. Um, and, you know, you, it's interesting to see Zemmour especially being so um, upfront about uh, the fact that he's not fighting Islamism, he's fighting Islam. And he mm -hmm. said, you know, even yesterday, again, in an interview, Islam is incompatible with France. So there is a, a, a need for uh, uh, the moderates to, to reclaim identity, but in a way that, that stays open. So I think mm -hmm. it's, a, it's a big challenge. Look, I also want to react, you know, because I agree with everything that Roland uh, and Sophie said uh, before. Um, you know, Sophie talked about the fact that the French have this critical spirit and the tend to be negative. I mean, I think we have a society or an elite more than a society, actually, an elite that confuses uh, cynicism with intellectual sophistication, unfortunately. You know, I live in the United States and uh, I think there's a culture of positivity and enthusiasm that's much more respectable, you know, to quote a... Um, a great but sometimes cultural, a little too much, come on. <laughs> sometimes, sometimes, you know, to quote a, uh, there's a great cultural reference on the Franco-American relationship, uh, Emily in Paris. There's this great scene where her boss in Paris tells her not to smile too much because she's going to look stupid. And I think that, that captures a, a difference between Americans and, and French very much so. Which, which leads me to a more important point. Um, no one since the General de Gaulle in 1965 has been reelected 
as president while holding an incumbent parliamentary majority in France. And so as we discuss the very real challenge of the rise of Marine Le Pen, the, the risk that I find realistic that she could be elected president tomorrow, I think that's something to take very seriously. I lived through 2016 in the United States, so you will never hear me make any prediction that the far right cannot win elsewhere. Um, but, it, but it is interesting you know, to note that Mitterrand and Chirac in 88 and uh, Chirac in, in 2002 were, were uh, re-elected after having lost the parliamentary majority. So they were running against their own prime ministers who were much more unpopular than them. Uh, Sarkozy and Hollande uh, were not reelected Giscard uh, d'Estaing in 81 either. So it, it is actually the French love to hate their politicians. Uh, you know, po popularity ratings, approval ratings for uh, presidents tend to be much lower in France than they are in other European countries. So it, you know, I think anyone who thought that this election would be easy uh, was clearly misguided. It's always really difficult to be reelected in France. And the fact that he is actually so close to being reelected with a uh, with his own majority does show that, you know, something he did something right. And, and I would point, as Roland said, you know, when I was a kid in France, uh, we were always saying we'll never solve unemployment. We've tried everything and it, it's here to stay. And you've seen the numbers decreased so much over the last few years, despite the pandemic, that it's not even an issue right now in French politics, which I think is unprecedented. So, you know, here's well, for the glass half full, I would say. Yeah. Um, well, thank you, Ben, for that. And thank you to all of our panelists. Um, we just have time for a few questions. I'm going to read the first of those from uh, Daisy Maslin, who is a a student in the college. Um, the question is, how do you think the Russian invasion of Ukraine and the way EU members and NATO have responded will impact the French election? And how do you think the result of the election will impact the trajectory of political stability in Europe? So we sort of talked about the influence of the election already, but let's talk about the second part of her question, which is the general sort of trajectory of political stability in Europe. So, um, I don't know. Um, anybody can jump in, but maybe um, maybe Roland, you have thoughts on that to start us off. Yeah, well, just very quickly, because I want everyone to be able to talk. And I think there's other questions, but uh, it's a gigantic wake up call for all of us. And uh, I think that, you know, we've been talking and uh, Benjamin Ben talked about the La Sorbonne speech that happened four years ago. And and now it's it's happening real. The pandemic was a wake up call and led us to have a recovery plan that was designed and financed together. It led us to buy vaccine together, export vaccine together elsewhere in the world, more than any zone in the world. But this is a big jump into uh, converging towards a common European defense policy, including real money, about 100 billion, um, being spent uh, on, on, uh, on this. So, you know, there's 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 a lot happening. I said 100 billion. That's too much. Sorry, but um, it's uh, not yet. But we have a, we have a we have a, a quantum leap that has happened through that crisis. As Churchill used to say, "Never let a good crisis go to waste." It's happening now. So I do think that you know the the the, the motto of Europe, which is united within our diversity, is truer than ever. If you can think now that Auburn, uh Paris, you know, Mr. Macron, Mr. Scholz are all agreeing to raise huge sanctions on Russia, are all agreeing to finance some kind of a beginning of a defense policy because of what happened in Russia. I think it's a, it's a, it's a testimony to, to the leap that's happening in Europe right now. So I do think that as we had at the late 80s, early 90s, a big turn towards joint monetary policy and then a joint single currency happening at an historic time of the fall of the burning wall. This is probably going to lead to what French people at least have been dreaming about for a long time, which is a much more integrated Europe, including on regalian policies, obviously defense, but also immigration, political asylum and, and all of that. Yeah. That's um. Thank you very much. I think I'm going to go ahead and ask our next question, just so we can fit it in before our, our time is up. Um, and the student is going to ask it himself on screen. So I will um, just allow him to do that. Hi, everyone. Uh, thank you very much for uh, this very interesting Zoom. Uh, so my question is basically uh, restating what you said uh, 
Mr. Lescure, um, that <clears throat> in, in terms of the polls, uh, the French have rallied behind Macron, who is for the first round around 30%, um, as a consequence of uh, the, the war in Ukraine. Uh, yet, Marine Le Pen is uh, closing the gap uh, more and more for the second round. Um, so, how can we assess this keener perception of Marine Le Pen? As more presidential, Zemmour, for example. And um, is, is Macron sacrifi sacrificing uh, his domestic politics, his campaign uh, as the new chef de guerre? And what is the consequence for this uh, in terms of um, the outcome in the legislative elections? Uh, Mr. Haddad talked about the uh, uh, 1988 election. Will Macron, La République En Marche, uh, have a, a majority? And uh, what will be the, um, the, the opposition uh, in terms of Reconquête and the Rassemblement National for, uh, for this election? Um, all right, that's a great question. Um, we unfortunately only have a, a few minutes left, but maybe, um, I don't know who wants to jump in. Um, maybe, uh, maybe Sophie, if you have thoughts about sort of um, all of those political ramific ramifications of the vote and Le Pen rising, et cetera. Um, I mean, in, in one minute, uh, hard yeah. to answer them all. I, I, I'll, I'll start with the last bit, which is what happened in the legislative elections. I think that um, a lot of outsiders are assuming that it would be very difficult for Macron to win a majority in parliament. That's the, that, that's the question that I'm coming across a lot. But I, it seems to me that's not impossible at all, um, partly because uh, of the state of the mainstream left and right. You know, after if the polls are right and neither the Socialist Party nor the Republican Party has uh, any chance of getting through to the second round, those two parties are not going to be in a fighting position to uh, wage a, a campaign for the legislature afterwards, it seems to me. And therefore, although you know it's, it's unclear if Macron won a majority, exactly what shape it would take, because it could be put together with various sort of bits and pieces, uh, all of which is quite fluid. Uh, and, and I'm not talking necessarily of, of a, a coalition, but you know, these sort of different groups, movements, think of the party that Edouard Philippe founded called Horizons. So I, I think it's perfectly possible to think about a um, that the French would you know, act logically and in, in keeping with the vote at the presidential election if Macron was re-elected, hand him a majority that it would that would be con composed of those constituent parts. Um, I, I, should I just stop there? Because I think we're running out of time. Yeah, I think that's right. Um, but let me just take this opportunity to thank all of our panelists for joining us today. Um, it was a pleasure to speak with you all as usual. And um, also thank you to our audience uh, for, for uh, sitting through this chat and uh, to our wonderful hosts at the University of Chicago. Um, we will all be watching with uh, keen interest the events in the next few weeks. and. It will be a fascinating time, needless to say. So uh, thank you very one much. Word, one word, James. If anyone in the audience is French, and I think Ferdinand could be by the sound of things, you guys in North America, you vote on the 9th and on the 23rd. So don't forget. Right. Very important. <laughs> all right. Thank you all so much.